Let's go ahead and open it to Matthew 13. I want to, really what I'm going to do is kind of bounce off of James chapter 5. James chapter 5 verse 16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man of like passion as we are, yet he prayed and the heavens were shut up for three and a half years, then he prayed again and the heavens were open. The Holy Spirit you know, without a question, is revealing to us the power of our prayers and the power of prayer, but also the power of one person whose heart is turned toward him uh, in faith with a pure heart, and God opens up supernatural rivers, and God wants to use every one of us. So uh, all week this week, this has been kind of going over in my heart, and it's just simply, God needs you. Everybody say, God needs me. God All right, Holy Spirit, we thank you for the word. We thank you for the anointing that breaks every yoke. Whatever need is represented in here, I thank you. You are here. And the need has already been met by the blood of Jesus. Father, I thank you. Open up our hearts. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see what the Spirit is saying. And we just receive that today in Jesus' name. And we just come against any confusion or any doubt whatsoever. And we thank you for the word of God. Amen. All right. God needs you. Here's four important points about God needs you. God needs you to see through his eyes. God needs your intercession to release his power. God needs your ears open to hear his voice. And God needs your obedience to do whatever he asked you to do. Uh, I'm going to say those again. God needs you to see through his eyes. God needs you, your intercession to release his power. God needs your ears open to hear his voice and God needs your obedience to do whatever he's asked you to do as I was uh, really praying and studying yesterday about this morning the Lord kind of reminded me of uh, a beautiful man that I met back in the 80s he was a missionary to the Philippines his name was Ernie Reb uh, Ernie was in his 60s when I met him and I was in my 20s and he was such a incredible man of God he'd done works all over the Philippines and so as we were over there we were doing some things with him he's with the Assemblies of God and we invited him to come to the States and uh, he began to really share and minister he taught in our school he came many times to the church and uh, I had I had really some good opportunities to just sit and pretty much glean when you have such a uh, just a senior in the things of God and an elder and all the things that he has done and how God used him it's just man you just sit there like a sponge that's all I was I was like oh my gosh and uh he was in the Philippines in the late 40s and 50s and uh, just traveling all over. And I'll ne But one of the stories he told, and I'll never forget this because it impacted me because it's so based on the Word of God and how the Holy Spirit spoke a word to him to encourage him. He said as he, uh, he and his wife were there and he had been really reaching different places and the Lord spoke to him concerning an unreached people group. They were up in the mountains, and I almost, if I can remember, I believe it was Mindanao, Annas from Mindanao, and I, if, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, it's in the mountains of Mindanao, and um, he really felt impressed that he was to reach this, this, this people group. Now, you're, you're going into a, a group of people who have never heard the gospel. That's completely different. Uh, than really what we face a lot of times in the United States because most of the people, if they even turn on television, they're going to hear uh, an evangelist or they're going to see something. But 
These people had never heard the gospel and not for sure the language that they spoke. So he goes to a, a little town. Uh, the, the people, of course, they were villagers. They lived up in the mountains. And he said he was there for a few weeks praying, and eventually he found him a house that he rented, and it was on the side of a mountain, and, and there was a trail that came down from the mountain. So they came down for water and for supplies and other things. And so uh, he, he just thought, okay, I can be right here, and as they come by each day, I'll minister to them, and that's where I'll start. And he said the, the weeks went into months and the months just kept going on and he had not reached one and he said I tried to be as friendly as I possibly could they were very uh, suspicious and they would have nothing to do with me and he said I would go up he said there was a little nook in a up in the mountain a little place had uh, little rocks and, and place where I could just kind of sit in and overlook uh, the bay and uh, he said I would just I'd climb up there and I would pray and I would pray and uh, he, he made the statement he said one day it was like the enemy Satan just kind of sat down right beside me and he said and I got so discouraged uh, I just was just broken because I felt like I know God called me. I know that I'm, but the, the, the enemy was just saying, you'll never reach them. Uh, you're, you've missed it. You're here. Nothing's going to happen. And, uh, of course, he began to pray. And then he realized who the voice was, and he began to just break the power of it. And he asked the Holy Spirit. He said, Father, I need to know. I need a word from you. I want to say this to every one of us. The answer for all of us is that we need a word from God. And that's it. All we need is a word from Him. And some of you may say, a word from God, what exactly does that mean? The majority of the time, the way the Holy Spirit speaks to us is through His Word, it is through the Scriptures. Uh, when, you, when you read the Bible, as you're reading, and it may be just in your daily reading, you may be listening to it, the Holy Spirit will speak through the Scriptures to give you something exactly what you need. And that's called revelation, and I'll talk about that in just a minute. But while he was in prayer up there looking over the bay, he said that he was impressed in his heart, read the parables. Go over to Matthew 13. And so he went over and he began to read in Matthew 13. And I'm going to start in verse number 12. And I want you to listen to what Jesus said. This is out of the Passion. It's very important. I believe it's so relevant for us today. For everyone who listens with an open heart will receive progressively more revelation until he has more than enough. Now, that's a powerful statement. But those who don't listen with an open, teachable heart, even the understanding that they think they have will be taken away from them. So Jesus starts here. He's teaching about the parables, and the very first thing he says those who read, who open their ears, open their hearts to receive. You, you know, you've got to come with an expectation to receive. You know, everything has to do with expectation. You know, if you come, I don't care where you go. You can go to any church, you can come in here, but if it's like the only thing I expect is that 12 o'clock I want to be sitting down eating then you're going to miss, and yet that's the way, how I many know that's the way some people are? But, you know, that's not this church, amen? But when you come in with an attitude, Father, I thank you before this ever starts, I, I expect to be touched from you today. I expect 
to be blessed. I expect to receive something from the Word of God. You know what? You'll receive. And it's because your heart is open. It has to do with every day of our life. If we get up and we expect this is the day the Lord's made and we will be we should what rejoice and be glad in it so if God created this day guess what he had you in mind all of heaven is available to us this very day so when we expect that then hey something good's going to happen to us amen? amen all right let me talk about revelation real quick the word revelation when you talk about you if I were to ask a group of you know, Bible students, what does the word revelation mean to you? Uh, I'd get all kind of different answers. You'd get a lot of theological answers. Well, this is what it is. This is, you know, the knowledge of the Bible. But revelation is not the knowledge of the Bible. There's two Greek words for the word, word of God. The first one is logos. Hebrews 4.12 says that the Word of God, it's quicker and it's powerful than any sharp two-edged sword. That is the word logos. That is this right here. It's the Bible. The logos is the Word of God. It is quick. It's powerful. But there's another word which is called rhema, which means revelation or revealed truth. I want you to look at this scripture, Matthew 4, 4. This is what Jesus said. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The word word here is the word rhema. And you say, what is that? That's revealed truth. That is revelation. In other, wa- other words, here it is. The Logos is sharper and more powerful than a two-edged sword. That's a powerful statement. But it will never become a reality in your life until the Logos becomes rhema. Let me explain this, and you've heard me tell this testimony. I'm going to make this as simple as, it ca- as I can, but when uh, Kim and I, uh, 1983, Kim was pregnant, we, we lost our child, she was born at six months, she died at birth, we went through a funeral, we came home, uh, the nursery had been set up, Kim, and, and I, I didn't say anything to her, I just kind of never said anything about the nursery, that was something we were going to have to walk through. We were dealing with it. Now, I want to say this. One thing in this life you're going to have to have a revelation of, and that is God is good. God is always good. I can't tell you why that happened. I can't go into detail of, you know, whatever. We didn't know there were complications in Kim's body. But here's the thing. No matter what happens in this world and what happens to come in the future, God is good, and he's always good. You know, it's so amazing what David did. Do you know that David did something totally different and just beyond, really, the commandment of God, and he did it from his heart. When, when the ark was taken by the Philistines and eventually David was able to bring it home, he didn't build the tabernacle of Moses. And the ark had always been in the tabernacle of Moses. That was the way things were done. The tabernacle actually needed to be rebuilt. But David didn't do that. He put the ark in a tent. And then he sets up 24 hours of praise and worship. And you just got to know God. He's he's up there going, check this out. (laughs) And he's watching David, first of all, dancing in the middle of the street as the ark was coming in. 
and he saw the man's heart and then David was smart enough to know I've got the very presence of God finally in Jerusalem he's now the king of Israel and Judah they've all come together and so he builds around the ark puts it in a tent and and begins 20 Four, seven. There were 24 different offices of musicians and people. They switched out every few hours. They switched out and they would come in. And you know what their song was for 24 7? The Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Wow. In all the mistakes that David made, can you imagine, even with the sin of Bathsheba, over here, in the, over here at the ark, they were singing, the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. And even through David's sin, he fell on the mercy of God. And I'm telling you, folks, the one thing you got to have in your heart for these days God is good, and his mercy endures forever. And his mercy has your name on it, and he's got your face. So with that, what Kim and I, we began to pray, we did, uh, for children. Doctor said you couldn't have kids, and so we went to the Scriptures, and we really, they told Kim that a child grows in the womb, you're going to abort it. She had was what was called an incompetent cervix. So, I mean, hearts were broken, but yet we were going to stand on the word and we begin to pray. Then one day, I came home. And she had made dinner. And I walked in and there was my place setting hers, and then there was an extra one. And I asked her, I said, who's coming to dinner? And she said, oh, that's our child. And I said, okay. And then when we sat down to eat, she said, Terry, I was praying, and the Lord gave me this scripture. Your wife, Psalms 28, 3, your wife shall be like a fruitful vine in the very heart of your house. Your children like olive plants all around your table. That was a revelation, a rhema word for her. You know what that did? That put faith in her heart. So when I came in, she had a place setting. Now, people would say, y'all are absolutely crazy. Because the world cannot see that you are seen into the unseen not the same you've got a word from God that God has spoken directly to you as the result of that I mean yeah every, pretty much the whole time she would put that place setting and she and I would just thank the Lord that was a rhema for her every one of you no matter what you're facing today or what you're gonna face there's a rhema there's a rhema and I'm going to tell you, in the time that you need it, honey, make sure you're in the Scriptures. Make sure the Word of God, because of the challenges that we face. Ernie was in a desperate place. He was quickened to read Matthew 13. So let's continue verse 24. Jesus begins to tell parables. And he gets to this certain parable, and it's about the seed. Jesus taught them another parable. Heaven's kingdom can be compared to a farmer who planted good seed in his field. And when everyone was asleep, an enemy came and planted weeds among the wheat and ran away. When the wheat sprouted and bore grain, the weeds also appeared. So the farmer's hired hands came to him and said, Sir, wasn't that good seed that you sowed in the field? Where did all these weeds come from? And he answered, This has to be the work of an enemy. 
And they replied, Do you want us to go and gather up all the weeds? And he said, No. If you pull out the weeds, you might uproot the wheat at the same time. Let them both grow together until harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters to gather the weeds first, tie them all in bundles to be burned. Then they will harvest the wheat and put it into my into my barn now it's very interesting jesus telling this parable to the apostles and he told other parables throughout matthew 13 about the seed this is the only parable that the disciples come back to jesus and ask him what did you really mean about the seed the weeds growing with uh, with the wheat what exactly do you mean? Now watch this. And I want you to watch what Jesus said. This was the revelation that Ernie got. Jesus left the crowds, went inside the house where he was staying. Then his disciples approached him and asked, please explain the deeper meaning of the parable of the weeds growing in the field of the wheat. Then he answered, and I want you to watch this. The man who sowed his field with good seed is the son of man. So everybody recognize this. God is the one who sows the seed. The field is what? The field is the world. Notice this next statement. The good seeds sown are the children of the kingdom realm. Guess what? You are a child of God, but you know what I'm looking at today? I'm, I'm looking at a bag of seed. That's exactly how God sees you. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. The, the, and he goes on and he says, the weeds are the children of the evil one, and the enemy sows them is the devil. The harvest points to what? The end of the age. And the harvesters are God's messengers. Guess what? The seeds grow up to become harvesters. I'm not only looking at a bag of seeds, I'm looking at a bunch of harvesters. And the thing about the seed, and this was the revelation that God gave Ernie. It was such a blessing to hear him tell this. What he saw in that, the Lord spoke to him and said, don't you be concerned because I have planted you like a seed. And how many of you know a seed produces after its own kind? And he said, don't be concerned about it. You're going to minister to these people. So you stay planted. You bloom where you're planted. And he said, man, with that word, he went back. And he was just, he, he, he turned from being discouraged to being thankful. I thank you, Father, you planted me. And if you planted me, I'm going to produce. I don't have to try to do it. God is the one who does it. And one day, something popped in his head. Offer them a glass of ice water. If you give a man a glass of water in the name of the Lord, you'll receive a righteous man's reward. And so he got a glass of ice water and he went down to the trail and he was speaking to some of them. He'd learned some of their language and he asked them, would they like some water? Well, you know, it's kind of hard not to deny water. And so they drank it and here's the thing, they had never had ice water ever. And so the next thing you know, they were sitting on his porch. And then it got out to all the village that this this guy down there close to the town uh, you know off the trail has the best water you've ever tasted then he said they were all over his porch and he was giving them water and then one day there was a man that came down the mountain with people 
with him and he was the chief and he came up and he sat on the porch and Ernie began to minister to him about the love of Jesus and about Jesus Christ and he said he drank that ice water and after several days he, he he'd come down and then he opened an invitation for Ernie to come up and preach the gospel to that village and uh, oh gosh they got saved he built a beautiful church and just the kingdom was just manifested why through ice water but everyone listen not just through ice water but through a revelation revelation makes the difference in er every area of our life the thing we have to see, God has pre-programmed a seed to produce after its own kind. Every one of us, you have been pre-programmed with a divine assignment. God has given to man the authority over the earth. And here's the statement, for God to operate, we have to cooperate. Everybody say that with me. For God to operate, we must cooperate. You say, why is that? And how in the earth, you know, how in the world does God need me? Well, the Bible says, Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our own image according to our own likeness and let them rule. Everybody say, let them rule. So guess what happened? When God created man, he had the keys. He had the keys of the earth. And when he said, let them rule, he turned around and handed the keys to man. So, what is the problem with the world today? It is the sin of fallen man. That's the problem. But now Jesus, what Jesus did, and when the devil came to Jesus and said, if you'll fall down and worship me, I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world. They were his to give. That was a real temptation to Jesus. And Jesus said, you shall worship the Lord God only, and him only shall you serve. What did Jesus say every time to the devil? He spoke the scriptures. It is written. It is written. He set the example for all of us. What is the it is written in your life? What's going on in your life right now? What are you facing? The Bible, the scriptures, the Holy Spirit wants to speak a divine revelation to your heart to give you peace, to give you rest, to make corrections or whatever. What Jesus did for us, Jesus turned around, defeated the devil, took the keys of death and hell. Revelation says... He has the keys of death and hell. In other words, he goes from all three worlds. Only he can do it. And what he did when he took the keys of death and hell, he turned back to his disciples. You know what he said? Now you go in my name. You heal the sick. You raise the dead. You touch people. Here it is. The seed becomes harvesters. And the thing we all have to see is that God is the one who planted every one of us. And I don't know, maybe we're all called to be Arkansas seed. But if you're an Arkansas seed, guess where you're going to bloom? You're going to bloom in Arkansas. I mean, confirming this real just makes it plain and simple. Isaiah chapter 6, again, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and his train filled, uh, filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. 
one cried to the other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out. And the house was filled with smoke. Now, that's a revelation. He saw God. He saw his glory. And what did he do? Woe is me. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Let me tell you what happens when we begin to get a revelation of the scriptures. You begin to see through God's eyes. You start seeing what he has for you you start seeing the plan he has for you you begin to see the way he thinks you begin to see what Jesus did and Isaiah's eyes were open I've seen the king this was an encounter how many of you want a new encounter amen well you have the right to ask for it you have the right to seek it God wants to reveal himself in a new, fresh way to us. He said, because I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. My eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. And one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it. And he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also... After this encounter, he hears. So here it is. We've got to see the Lord. We've got to be able to hear his voice. I hear the Lord. Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Now, th this is the thing you have to see throughout the scriptures. Why in the world would God say, who will go for us? I mean, come on, he's God. Hey, guys, he's God. He created it. He created the whole universe. In one spoken word, he's going to do away with the universe and create another one, and we all get to watch. Now, that's going to be fun. But we're dealing with God. Why would he say, who will go for us? You'd almost want to say, go for yourself. You're God. Why do you need me? It's because he gave the keys and the rule to man. God doesn't do anything in the earth unless he does it through us. That is one of the greatest revelations you can get is that God actually needs me. Not only does he need you, he needs you to hear what he's saying he needs you to see what he's seeing and he needs you to be obedient to what he tells you to do you know why because he wants to use you and bless you guys in ways you never dreamed or you ever thought of and you know what Isaiah said here am I send me and he's asking Isaiah the question you know anybody who will go for us that's a fact hey Isaiah now you've seen me you got you know anybody who'll do something for us he goes me I'll do it because I've seen you and I've heard you and you've revealed yourself to me and now use me You know, when you set your hand to do something for the Lord, God gives you, God will give you a revelation. You don't have a clue how the Lord, what God's going to do with it. Uh, 1984, I believe it was 83 or 84, the Spirit of God gives me one night the revelation of the armor bearer to be an armor bearer to my leader. 
10 years of working with a pastor, I hear in my heart, write a book, call it God's Armor Bearer, How to Serve God's Leader. I wrote that book, and God breathed on it and went all over. I didn't have a clue what the Lord was going to do. I'm no author. You never know your abilities until you put your hand to do and to be a sent one. When you, when you decide, you know what? These are the last days. The whole world's going to hell in a handbasket. But you know what? I'm going to be one of those that's going to give life. Reveal to me your plan. I got a phone call from... Uh, a young man several months ago and he was from Virginia and he asked to meet with me and we set up a time uh, and this Friday I had lunch with him and he was Southern Baptist it was very graduated from Liberty University he was a uh, nice young man and small children and all and he began to talk to me and he said he said you don't know this he said, but I was on staff at Liberty University. I had a big, we had a beautiful, huge, this was Jerry Falwell's ministry. We had a huge boardroom and a, and a huge round oak table. You could get 15 or 20 people around it. And he said, I had a group of young ministers. And he said, I just want you to know it. I taught them out of your book. And I said, wow, hallelujah, I got into a Southern Baptist University, you know. And he shared with me, he said, the reason why I'm here is I'm getting my doctorate, and I'm doing it on the armor bearer. And I said, wonderful. Then he told me, he said, I want you to, I want you to know and pray with me because this is the vision I have. He said, there are no universities that have a curriculum on the armor bearer. He said, and every, all our graduates are graduating in and, and ministry. They've got their bachelor of science degree or their master's degree. In less than a year, they're out of the ministry. And he said, it's because they never learn the principle of the armor bearer. He said, I'm starting a network. I'm writing my paper to get my doctorate. And he said, my goal is to, to build a curriculum that will be used in all the Southern Baptist universities. I said... That is incredible. And I just laughed. I said, that's great. Y'all think about it. Someone who speaks in tongues is going to be a book in the Southern Baptist. That's what tickles me, you know. And yet, you know, he was sharing. I said, you know what? I said, that is just wonderful. I said, I'm going to pray for you. Look, you can use my material, of course. You just let me know what you want to do with it and I said but I'll tell you what that's a vision and he says it's needed he serves on a staff he is the executive pastor of a, of a church in uh, uh, North Carolina he works under a senior pastor and there's got nine or ten uh, ministers on staff and so he's working again on his doctorate getting everything he's writing it on this but you know what the thing, I'm going to be flat honest with you, the thing when I look back at that, you know what it humbles me to think, Lord, all I did was obey, everybody listen to me, a revelation that you gave me. And what I'm saying to you, God's not through with giving revelations. Every one of you have, a, have something that the Holy Spirit has put on the inside of you. And in being faithful, he's going to breathe. And it may be in a, in a situation of need. God loves to shine in places of need. When we call upon him, he hears us. And so today, my prayer for every one of you, it's time to seek the Lord. It's time to hear his voice. It's time to see what he sees. It's time to be obedient to what he tells you to do. It's time to intercede the way he would intercede for people. God's about to release 
incredible gifts and callings. Stand up with me. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Hallelujah.